Welcome back. We're now on our last section, section eight. So a couple of things. I want to make sure you have your practice questions, one set that I sent you when you enrolled in the class. So if you haven't already done those on your own, stop the video now, do those, and then come back. If not, we're ready to go over the practice questions. Let's start with number one. The DRE's main mission is to protect the public and real estate matters. So it's not to make sure we're doing okay as realtors or as licensed salespeople, it's to protect the public and real estate matters. And just as we're going forward, just know that A is Alpha, B is Bravo, C is Charlie, and D is Delta. So if you hear me say D or Delta, I'm referring to D. I kind of like the way that sounds too. All right. So number one, the DRE's main mission is Delta to protect the public and real estate matters. Number two, per the DRE, the relationship between a broker and salesperson. So remember, when you get your salesperson license, it's great, but you can't do any deals on your own. You're going to have to be under the employment of a broker. And these are the names you know, right? Keller Williams, Coldwell Banker, Pinnacle, Remax, and the hundred, the Oppenheimer Group, the hundred of other brokers. So, uh, names you've heard. So you're going to get a license and you're going to be a salesperson under the employment of a broker. And that relationship, as far as the DRE is concerned, is one of employee and employer. So what's the relationship? Bravo, employer and employee. If a licensee violates a real estate law, who would prosecute them? Not me as your broker. I'll try to cover it up. What, who will prosecute you? The local district attorney. So when you get a real estate license or you get a contractor license or you get a barber license or you get a beautician license from the state of California, there's laws associated with that license. Got it. And those laws are found in the California Civil Code. Now, when you violate a law, you may have not have robbed the 7-Eleven, but it's still a crime. So who would prosecute you if you violate a real estate law? The local district attorney. Number three is Charlie. Number four, the consumer recovery account. Well, that's just like that mission statement we talked about that the DRE's kind of main goal is to protect the public. And one of the ways they do it is they have this recovery account, which is funded by you and me. When you pay for your license dues, that's $245 currently. And they take a little bit of that money and they put it into this fund. And then if someone has a judgment against you that you didn't pay on your own, your broker didn't pay, your insurance didn't pay, that public could go to the DRE and try to collect. Now, it's not unlimited. There's certain limits that we covered in, in the lecture part of this uh, class where it was 50,000 max per transaction, if you remember that, 250 lifetime max. So this question is saying, what's true of the consumer recovery account? Well, the answer is Delta, that it pays judgments against licensees and it's funded by you and me, Delta. Number five, a real estate license applicant who's on the list of child support Obligers. What does that mean? That means you owe your baby mama or your baby daddy some money. And they're still going to give you a license, except we're all getting a license for four years. That individual would get a temporary license for 150 days. And should they pay what they owe, it'd get expanded to the four years. So what's number five? Alpha. They can obtain a license, but a temporary 150-day license. Number six, every four years, Bravo, we can renew our license. So you're all getting your license today. Four or in a couple of weeks, hopefully, from from that point forward, every four years you renew your license. Now you don't have to take the state exam anymore. You just have to take a simple continuing education class or a CEU that many of you probably already do now. You know, for for CPA, psychology, other things. So you'll do a uh, CEU class for real estate, which my school offers it, and then you renew your license. You have to take the state exam again every four years. So number six, Bravo. A broker must have a trust fund account. That was that separate checking account that if a client ever gives you money, you hold it there in trust, not in your personal account, not in your business account, but in a trust fund account. And that's becoming more and more rare because we usually wire money now. We don't use physical checks. However, as a broker of the office, I must reconcile, that means balance that checkbook because it's basically a checkbook, every 30 days. Make sure you know that. So a broker must reconcile their trust fund account every 30 days, monthly. This is just a vocabulary word. As the value of real property increases over time, what do we call that? Appreciation, delta, appreciation, good old appreciation. 
Number nine, legally and technically, property is defined as Charlie, the rights or interests which a person had in the thing owned. And that's a good way of kind of thinking about whether real property or personal property, that it's a bunch of rights that you own when you own that thing, if you will. When we talk about real property, we have a bundle of rights, right? If you can picture a tree and you grab one branch, you have the right to physically be there in that house. Another branch, maybe there's water rights. Another branch, maybe there's gold underneath the house. You have mineral rights. Another branch, the right to physically be there. So you have a bundle of rights when you own real property. Then this will set us up for some future questions. So let's say I ask you, uh, how do we transfer all those rights from me to you when it comes to real property? A grant deed, a grant deed. So now it kind of makes sense. So a grant deed, its name comes from I, Armando Oliva, grant to you all the rights and interest in the thing owned for valuable consideration. So number nine, Charlie. Legally and technically, property is defined as rights or interest which a person has in the thing owned. Number 10, which of these would be considered real property? Delta, a load-bearing wall. The wall holding up the entire house, yeah, that, that's probably going to go with the house, right? But some of you might have been a little kind of on the fence about Charlie, a mature gra grape crop, which is under a set. You may go, well, why isn't a crop real property? Because isn't it attached to the ground, a fixed ground? Uh, yeah, for sure. But this is an exception to the rule, if you will. So whenever you see the word crop or harvest, I want you to immediately think that someone put work in, right? Someone put fertilizer, water, tended to the crops, talked to them. I don't know what they do, but they, they invested into growing that crop, that 100 acres of corn or 100 acres of avocado, whatever. That is an exception to the rule. That's their personal property from their labor. That does not go automatically with the house or with the farm or anything else. Now, your front yard, that's just vegetation. Your one lemon tree in the backyard, that, that you didn't plant that for resale uh, of the lemons, right? So that's vegetation. But here, in the context of a crop, I want you to always default to that's personal property to the owner. So delta, the wall holding up the house, that's real property that goes with the house. Number 11, all the following are considered an estate in real property, except, don't, don't let that word screw you up on the state exam. So, okay, so they're asking for which one doesn't belong, basically. They're saying all of these go together except one, right? That's what they're saying. Well, we learned about two types of estates in our lecture part of the class. We learned about freehold estates, right? Ownership of real property. And we learned about leasehold estates, ownership of the right to physically be there like in a lease. So an estate in reversion was a type of life estate, which was a type of freehold estate. Fee simple was a type of freehold estate. Leasehold was a leasehold estate. But a deed of trust, no, that was a security instrument. That, that was a way to secure a home loan. That had nothing to do with freehold estates or leasehold estates. So the question is saying all these go together except. So the answer is bravo, deed of trust. Number 12, real property. Remember all those rights and interest in the thing owned when it comes to real property? Includes, well, it's not chattel mortgages because that word chattel, think cattle. Chattel equals cattle and that's a cow, a pig. That, that's personal property. Not trustees. Those are home loans. Vegetation, cut timber. So cut timber, it was attached and now it's no longer attached. Vegetation, that's real property. When you sell your home, that front, you don't roll up the front yard and take it with you. That, that front yard goes with the house. So number 12, of these four, real property includes vegetation. Number 13 is just a straight definition word that you need to know. So a property owner living on a river bank, right? So you're in front of a river and the river's dropping sand, soil, sediment, and you're like, wow, honey, we got a big kind of front yard now. That's called accretion. A Accretion, adding land through natural forces. Number 13, bravo, accretion. Make sure you know that word. 14, which one of these would not terminate the fact that you and I or me, you and him are joint tenants? Well, we got to remember what joint tenants is, right? Joint tenants is a way of taking title to real property where we give each other the right to survive each other. What does that mean? That means if you die, I get it. I die, you get it. Not my children, not your heirs, but you and I on this property have the right to survive each other. Now, this question saying, 
Which one of these does not mess with the fact that you and I have decided to take title as joint tenants? Well, Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie all changed the owner, right? If I got foreclosed on, who owns it now? The bank. If I, <coughs> excuse me, if I sold it, someone else owns it. If I deed my interest to someone else, someone else owns it. But Delta, one joint tenant borrowing money on their percent, that doesn't affect the rest of us. That just affects that person. And that wouldn't mess with our joint tenancy. So of these four things, which one would not terminate the fact that you and I or you and us are joint tenants? Delta. The fact that you borrowed money on your percent. That, that's between you and whatever lender lent it to you. Number 15, the land that is benefited by an easement. Well, we got to remember what an easement is. An easement is the right to cross or use another's land. Okay, so maybe you have the house in back, I have the house in front, and you have the right to cross my driveway to get to your house. Okay, so you have an easement, which also means I have to let you, right? I can't just build a wall. I got to let you cross my driveway whenever you want. So when there is an easement like that, there's a property that benefits that we call dominant. And there's a property that has to allow it, which we call servient. The land that is benefited by an easement is called dominant. Charlie. 16, which of the following is always required for that joint tenancy we just talked about? Well, in order for us to be joint tenants with the right of survivorship, we need to agree on a few things. Number one, our ownership is equal. No matter how many there is. Maybe there's 10 of us, 10%. Two of us, 50-50. So ownership is equal. All our names are on the deed to the house. And we all do this at the same time. The only thing we really have to uh, agree to for tenants in common is the right to possess it. But for joint tenants, we have to agree to what we call the four unities. Now, this question is asking, well, which one of these things do we need to be joint tenants? Well, we definitely have the right of survivorship, but we never said you need the clause. So it's not alpha. Not husband and wife. I mean, we don't have to be married, so it doesn't, not Charlie. And all of the above would mean we have to be married, and that's not true. So bravo. Equal shares of interest in property by, yes, you definitely need that. If we're going to be joint tenants, we need to have equal interest in the property, however many of us there is. So 16, bravo. Now, when we talked about encumbrances, remember we said encumbrances are burdens, and burdens that have to do with money are called liens. Okay, And then we said, well, what if on your house you have a lot of liens? Well, how do you know which one's first? By the date of recordation. Recorded where? At the county recorder's office. Not in your little Hello Kitty journal. Where do you record stuff? At the county in which the property is located. So, but there's an exception to that rule. Remember from our lecture on encumbrances? What was the exception to the rule? mechanics liens. That's a contractor. So a contractor does work on your property and maybe they dropped off material four months ago. If they can show maybe a, 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 a delivery receipt or something that they actually started to work four months ago, their mechanics lien would not take effect the day they recorded the lien, but rather when they started the work. That's a, that's a little bit way to protect them as far as statute goes. So a judgment lien would differ from a mechanics lien in that Bravo, a mechanics lien could take priority earlier than the date they are recorded. Remember, if you see a question that says, is there a uh, exception by statute when it comes to liens? Yes, mechanics lien could get recorded earlier. Bravo. 18, which of the following is required for a valid escrow in the conveyance of title? All conveyance means is transferring ownership. Well, unfortunately, we know it's not alpha. You don't need a broker. What did we call it when someone sells their own home without using a broker? Cheap. No, I'm just kidding. For sale by owner. What is for sale by owner? FSBO. I need you to know that. What's FSBO stand for? For sale by owner. But that's not required here. So you don't, a broker is not required. A complete chain of title. No, you don't need a complete chain of title. You don't even need title insurance if you're paying cash. No conditions. No, you can have conditions. You can say condition on me doing a home inspection. But you do need a written agreement. Bravo. So which one of the following do you need for a valid conveyance of real property? You need a binding contract between buyer and seller and the conditional delivery of transfer of insurance. All that says is a purchase contract. So bravo. 19, the subdivision map act. So if I buy dirt, I cut it in half, I'm a subdivider, period. That's by definition. 
I subdivided the, the land. And certain laws start kicking in. Well, the first law that kicks in is called the Map Act. So I grab that dirt, I cut it in half. The first law that kicks in is the Map Act. So bravo, two or more. Now, if I keep going, three, four, five, like I have a subdivision, in addition, not instead of, in addition, another law kicks in called the Subdivided Lands Law. So think about that later. But for this question, the Map Act, two or more. So 19, bravo. 20, if a man leaves the store for six months, that's a fixed amount of time. So when we talk about leasehold estates, which we did already, remember we said leases can either be for a fixed amount of time and a state for years, and that could be eight months, it's still in the state for years, or month to month, period to period. In this case, they're telling us the term is six months, that's a fixed amount of time, so number 20 is bravo, and a state for years. 21, a broker arranges for a seven-year lease agreement between a tenant and the property owner, the usual method of compensation. So residential gets a lot of the uh, hype in, in our business, right? Because we're all around houses and we're watching Selling Sunset and everything out. But there's a whole other part of our business that you can do with the same license you're getting in commercial real estate. And when you're representing commercial tenants, they don't want to sign a one-year lease because they're spending a lot of money on improving that retail space, that warehouse space, that office space to do business for hopefully a long time. So they may sign a five-year lease, a 10-year lease, a 30-year lease. And you as the broker arranging that, you can get paid a percent of the whole lease term, which could be 10 years. However, because that's a lot of money, Sometimes the landlord says, you've earned it, I'll pay you the whole lease term, but I'm gonna pay it to you monthly or annually as I get paid. So 21 delta, a percentage of the total lease for sure, you've earned that, but it might be paid out monthly or annually. 22, make sure you know 22. When rent is computed on the gross sales of a business, that lease is correctly termed a percentage lease. Where are you gonna see that? Well. If you're in Southern California, you may know the Commons, the Americana, the Grove. Uh, if you're in California, I'm sure you know Westfield shopping malls. Well, very often the type of lease that they give their tenants is based on their the tenant's gross sales. So if you see any question that says, hey, when the landlord's interested in your gross sales, what type of lease are you dealing with a percentage lease? Why? Because they're gonna charge you a percent of those gross sales. Mostly because they feel they've earned it, right? They feel because they built such a beautiful uh, mall or a beautiful strip center that they're bringing you business because it's a destination location. But connect gross sales with percentage lease. 22, Delta. 23, which of the following is not an encumbrance? Remember, an encumbrance is kind of a negative. It's a burden, it limits your use. So they're asking you here, which one does not limit your use or burden you? Well. A lease kind of limits your use, even though you're getting money because you can't just go in your house whenever you want because you have a tenant there now. An easement, right? You can't build a wall. Maybe you have to let your neighbor cross. That kind of limits your use. A lien is weighing down the house. But homestead, homestead has a couple of different kind of definitions in real estate. But for our purposes, it's something positive. It's protection from unsecured creditors taking your home. So at the very least, homestead is good for you as a homeowner. So 23 Delta, the question saying which one is not a burden? Well, Delta, a homestead is not. 24, each of the following are specific liens except, so again, when you see except, which one doesn't belong? So three are specific, one's general. Because liens can be specific only on the house in question or general on everything. Maybe you own more than one home, maybe your car, or your dog, whatever. So. Which one? Well, a judgment lien. Because when you lose a lawsuit, they can put a lien on everything you own, not just on one thing. But your property taxes are on the house that's collateral for the property taxes. An attachment lien is when you're doing some type of litigation and the court decides to put a lien on that house so that it doesn't get sold while it's being adjudicated. And a mechanics lien is only the property where the contractor did the work. So those are all specific, but alpha, a judgment lien is general. It's a general lien. A sublease, so you're renting out a house and you rent out one of the rooms. Okay, so a transfer of less than the entire household to the sub lessee, Charlie. A transfer of less than the entire household to the sub lessee. 
26, tenants in common. So we talked earlier about the joint tenants, right? Equal ownership at the same time, all our names on it, the right of survivorship. Well, the most common way all of us would own real estate if we're not married, tenants in common. We could have unequal ownership. We could leave it to our kids. We could sell it. We could, we, very flexible. The only thing we have to agree to is the right to possess it, right? Meaning you don't have the bathroom and I have the kitchen. Like I own 8% of the whole, you own 92% of the whole. So the only thing we have to agree to is the unity of possession. 27, for homestead to be effective, that was that protection from unsecured creditors. You must file that before you get a judgment recorded against you. Bravo. Now, when we talked about agency, I think it was video one, when we talked about agency, we said, when you create an agency relationship, seller agency, buyer agency, dual agency, it triggers a responsibility. Now you have to look out in the best interest of the client, right? Of your principal called a fiduciary duty. So this question is saying, who has a fiduciary duty to the other party, just like you and I have a fiduciary duty to our customer out of these four choices? Well, if we know that trustor is borrower and mortgager is borrower, we can answer it quickly. It's the trustee. Because Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie are all the borrower. When you're borrowing money from the home loan, from the lender, you don't work from the lender. Like You don't owe them a fiduciary duty. You just don't lie on your application, but you don't owe them. But a trustee, that works. That person works for the lender. So Delta, a trustee would owe a fiduciary relationship to the beneficiary. Delta, make sure you understand that. 29, agents must present offers until the deal's closed. Not until you open escrow. Because some of you who've kind of been in this business or maybe your parents bought a house and it fell out or whatever, you realize that just opening escrow doesn't mean it's a done deal. Because people might fall out because they don't like the house now because they did home inspections. Or maybe they weren't able to get the loan. Or maybe the appraisal came in low. So there's a lot of things that just because we're, it's, now it's a good good indicator that we're in escrow that we're very likely to close, but it's not 100%. So you should review offers. That doesn't mean accept because you've already accepted one, but review offers until the close of escrow. Because that way you can say, hey, listen, um, if this guy backs out, we'll take your offer. Okay, great. And now the seller doesn't have to stress because he hopefully has some backup offers. So agent must present offers to the seller until the close of escrow. Delta. When dealing with the general public, which of the following may a broker not do? Well, Charlie, remain silent regarding material facts because don't you have a fiduciary duty to the client and you're going to remain silent that you know this black mold in the kitchen, right? In fact, when we talked about agency, which again, I think was a video one, we talked about your fiduciary duty and how that also involves you now doing a reasonable visual inspection of all accessible areas and disclosing any material facts. And I think in video five, we talked about the TDS or the transfer disclosure statement where yes, the seller has a duty to disclose anything they know is wrong with the house, but you as a broker also have to disclose anything you notice in a reasonable visual inspection of the home as well as part of your fiduciary duty. So number 30, Charlie, you can't stay quiet. 31, this one's kind of like, now you're, you're, most of my students are getting younger and younger, but like we used to have a joke that say, who's buried in Grant's tomb? And people were like, uh, and the, and the answer was, well, Grant, you know, Grant is buried in Grant's tomb. And dumb, dumb joke, but that's how it was. So this is kind of like that. If I say you have buyer agency, what does that mean? That you're representing the buyer. Bravo. So if I say you have buyer agency, that means you're representing the buyer. Bravo. If I say you have seller agency, that means you're representing the seller. Or in California, you can represent both sides. What do we call that? Dual agency, correct. 32, how big's an acre? That's one you should know just for life, right? Because people always advertise real estate on one acre. Nobody knows how big that is. Or agents love to say on a quarter acre, like, well, how big's that? Well, now you know. One acre is 43,560 square feet. Bravo. Uh, do you remember on our notes, how many feet in a mile? 5,280 feet in a mile. Make sure you, you memorize the class notes that we went over. I mean, they're, they're very important. It's, it's kind of like a one-two punch. We need to understand these questions and we need to understand the subject matter. With those two, you will pass. 33. What is the name of the agreement whereby the agent has the right to represent the seller 
and purchase himself. Oh, wait a minute. So, okay, so you have a listing, but now you're saying you want the right to buy, not the obligation, but the right to buy. Well, that's an option, right? When I have the right to do something, but I'm not obligated to do it, that's an option. And I'm representing you on this. Okay, well, that's, first of all, you should never do that because that's a conflict of interest kind of. But for this question, that's an option listing. Now, if you get a question like this, where the broker has the right to buy it himself, they're kind of also saying, well, I may act as a principal also, right? Not only am I acting as a broker, but I'm also acting as a principal possibly. They would have to inform any potential buyers that they may also act as a principal. Because you as a buyer probably want to know that you may be in competition with the broker themselves. So 33 is problem. 34, that fiduciary duty that gets formed when we have an agency relationship, the agency of a real estate broker may be established by any of the above. Your actions might bind you. Your words may bind you. Uh, after the fact, if you and the client agree that, yes, you were representing them, that may bind you. So 34, any of the above could create an agency relationship. 35, a licensed real estate salesperson is directly responsible to their employing broker. Remember, the salesperson must work for an employing broker. Now, how many brokers can you work for at a time? One. That doesn't mean you can't leave, but you can only work for one, and that broker needs to supervise you. So in this case, a licensed real estate salesperson is directly responsible to their employing broker. 36, the seller in a real estate transaction decided not to pay you your commission. Uh-oh. Which of the following should you do? Well, you're not a contractor where you're going to put a mechanics lien. You're not going to complain to the DRE. They could care less. But you did have a written agreement and they breached that. So you might sue them in civil court. Charlie, file an action in civil court. Now, 37, you need to know this word, estoppel. It's kind of a weird word. If we had more time, it's an interesting legal idea. Estoppel means detrimental reliance. I relied on your promises to my detriment. Well, in real estate, when you're buying a income producing property, you're really relying on what they tell you the tenants are paying as part of your valuation, right? So if you're buying a strip center with a subway and a Dunkin' Donuts and a, you know, a pool, pool store, you want to make sure that the tenants are paying what they told you they're paying. So you send them out this certificate called an estoppel certificate that they sign. And now when you own it, they can't go back on what they said to your detriment. So 37, Charlie, a document confirming the term of lease that the tenant has no claims against the landlord. 38, when a salesperson takes a listing, so the salesperson takes a listing, who owns it? The broker does. Yeah, you did all the work. Yes, but technically the customer is doing business with the brokerage, not with you. So the broker, even if you leave that office, technically the broker owns that listing. So bravo. 39, which of the following listings would the agent who was the procuring cause? Remember, procuring cause in law means the reason it sold. You were the reason for the sale. You still got paid no commission. Huh, so you, you brought the buyer, you were the, and you, well, of these four choices, a net listing, because Maybe you brought the buyer, but it wasn't at an amount minimum to cover the minimum seller net proceeds, so you got nothing. Well, you shouldn't have agreed to that type of listing to begin with, right? You should have agreed to an exclusive right to sell where you can charge three, four, five, six percent, whatever you negotiate on whatever the final sales price is. With a net listing, you were saying, well, I agree that I only get paid if the seller nets a certain amount, and maybe in this case they didn't net that amount. So you did all the work and got paid nothing. 39 is Delta. 40, when a real estate broker becomes an agent for a seller or buyer in a real estate transaction, what type of relationship is it? Fiduciary, fiduciary. So, and that's why we make such a big deal about agency where we say, oh, you have an agency relationship because that triggers a fiduciary relationship, a duty of utmost care, honesty, integrity, and loyalty. 40 is Bravo. 41, Edison sold his land with an easement apartment for road. So Edison had an easement on his land that allowed him to cross his neighbors whenever he wanted. The deed to the buyer contained an adequate description of the land, but it failed to make a reference to the easement. So the deed didn't really say anything about it. Well, that doesn't matter. Whatever rights and interests the seller had in the thing owned gets transferred to the buyer. So Charlie has the same right to the easement as the seller 
did. So 41 is Charlie. 42, when a young buyer decided to purchase their first home, they decided to take title as John and Mary Buyer, husband and wife. How did they take title? Well, the fact that they're mentioning husband and wife, that's community property, community property. 42 is community property. 43, none of the following parties may enter into a contract except, so three won't work, one will. Now, they're not talking about like UFOs here. They're talking about you're a resident alien or a non-resident alien. So can a minor enter? No. So Alpha and Bravo are gone. Can some guy in prison that you're pen palling? No, he can't enter into uh, a contract. But can a resident alien or a non-resident alien? Yes. So 43 is Charlie. 44, when a lessee, that's the tenant, the landlord is the lessor, right? Lessee, tenant, landlord, lessor. So the tenant assigns, this is not a sublease, this is where you say, hey, you pay, you pay everything to the landlord, I'm leaving. Uh, alpha is no longer obligated for the rent. 44 is alpha. 45, an unfurnished apartment, how much security deposit can you charge? Well, in California, there's a law that says there's a max to how much security deposit you can charge if it's unfurnished, and that's two times the monthly rent. You don't have to charge two times, but that's the most you can charge. So 45 is Charlie. Now, what if the question said furnished? Very good. Three times the monthly rent would be the max. Now, you could charge zero. That's not a good idea. But it, this law basically says that's the max you can charge, not minimum. So 45, unfurnished apartment, what's the most you can charge? Two times the monthly rent. 46, a tenant in good standing, wants a sublease or wants a sign, and the lease he signed has no wording whatsoever about subleasing or signing. There's nothing that says, oh, it needs landlord approval or anything else. Then guess what? You can. So Delta may sublease or sign the leasehold to anyone since the lease made no mention of any restrictions on such action. So 46 is Delta. 47, a real estate broker who specializes in selling residential property in any given area may refuse to accept the listing on a property in that area for which of the following reasons? Well, Alpha and Bravo are kind of discriminatory. Like you don't want to take it because the person's a minority. But Charlie, well, the guy has a crazy price and you don't think you can sell it for that. Well, that's fine because the owner's required price is substantially above the market in the area of the, yeah, you can say, I'm sorry, I, I don't I think I'm wasting your time, my time. I can't take a listing that's so overpriced. 47 is Charlie. Make sure you know 48. The maximum term for an agricultural lease is 51 years. Make sure you know that. Now, remember in our notes, what was the maximum term for residential? Good, 99. You have been studying, 99. Very good. 49, insurance can be described as kind of all of these kind of describe insurance, right? Transfer risk, uncertainty for certainty, all these. So all of the above. Insurance can best be described as all of the above. Now, when we talked about trust deed loans, we said there's a promissory note, the contract to pay the money back, and that's secured by the deed of trust. That's what makes up most home loans. So a loan secured by real property consists of Bravo, a promissory note, and a deed of trust. A promissory note and a deed of trust. The trust deed secures the promissory note. Now, there was that kind of financial instrument for seller financing called a land sale contract where the seller gets payments from the buyer and when they get enough payments, that's when they give title to the buyer. So until then, what does the buyer get? Well, they get equitable title, which gives them the right to possess it. They're not renting, they are owning, but it's not as clean as the regular. So in a land sales contract, the buyer gets possession of these four alpha. Later on, the same question, the answer might be equitable title. 52 is more of a philosophical question. A change in which of the following would have an effect on real estate in future years? Mm, consumerism, people don't want bigger, better, best. Land use, you can't build anymore. Real estate, you can only buy through Amazon. Mm, I guess Delta then. All of these might change our industry. 52. When a buyer uses CalVet financing, remember when we talked about loans, we said there's two 
loans for veterans, people that have served this great country of ours. There's the VA loan, which is kind of a federal loan program for veterans uh, or current military. And then there's CalVet in California that says, hey, we'll, we'll do it a little differently and then the veteran can choose which one. And the way they do it differently is they offer a land sale contract, which is also known as a contract of sale. So 53 is bravo, bravo. 54, the document used to transfer title to business opportunities. Most businesses, the liquor store, the shoe store, the candy store, don't own real estate. They, they own the material, the, the products, the inventory. And that's fine. When they sell that, they're not selling real property. They're selling personal property. And we use a bill of sale for that. Make sure you know that. Bill of sale. So 54 is Charlie. 55, the liquidation of a financial obligation or on an installment. Basically, what they're saying is paying off a loan. Right. So liquidation going down to zero over time, that, that's an amortized loan. So you need to know an amortized loan is one in which you pay principal and interest every month. And then if you go long enough, like 30 years, you pay that down to zero. So 55 is alpha. 56, when a buyer has recently purchased a home with a valid land sale contract, what type of title does the buyer have? Bravo, equitable title, equitable title. 57, which of the following is not an essential element in the formation of a contract? If you remember when we talked about contracts, we said a contract has four legs, legal capacity, mutual consent, lawful purpose, and sufficient consideration. And when it's missing one of those, it falls. But we never said you need performance to be done immediately for it to be valid. And performance is usually in the future. So it does need an offer and acceptance, capable parties, but performance, that could be in the future. It doesn't need it right now to be essential. So 57 is Delta. 58, escrow instructions must be signed. Not notarized necessarily, but signed. That means executed. Bravo, executed. All the following contracts are voidable, meaning if you wanted to, you could keep going. It's not automatically void. Voidable means you have the choice to void it or not. But one of these, you, you don't have the choice. Well, if it's for an illegal purpose, it's missing one of the legs from the beginning. It's not even a choice to go forward. It's, it's void. So all the following except an illegal purpose loan that, that's, or a contract that's not valid from the beginning. Bravo. Very often, lenders will say, hey, I'm going to lend you 70% of the value of the home. I'm going to lend you 90% of the value. What they're really saying, they're going to lend you 80% loan to appraised value. So loan to value may be best defined as Charlie, mortgage loans as a percent of appraised value, Charlie. 61 is more of a statement of fact. When you're selling a mobile home, that's personal property. They usually are on a park lease where they pay rent. They don't own the land. And that park has rules. And one of the rules is when you're done advertising the property, you, you have to pick up all your signs within 48 hours of that termination. So 61 is bravo. He has 48 hours from termination to stop all advertising. 62, the substitution of a new contract for an old one, novation. Nova in Latin means new. So if that helps, nova, new. So a new contract for an old one, novation. The substitution of a new contract for an existing one, novation. Now, in our business, words ending in OR are usually the owner, right? The, the lessor, the, the grantor, the trustor. So it kind of makes sense here who would sign the, the contract that gives away their rights. Well, the only one ending in OR, Bendor. The other three all end in EE, they're the receiver, right? Grantee, trustee, transferee, vendee. But the Bendor is the one that signs the real property sale contract, kind of giving away their rights. 63 is Charlie. Okay, this one you should know right away. What year did they ban lead and paint? 1978. How many feet in a mile? 5,280 feet. What does EMD stand for? Earnest money deposit. All right, let's keep going. So 64 was Bravo. 65. What gives the broker the authority to hold the buyer's deposit for three business days? Well, if we kind of use the process of elimination here, we go, well, okay, if the buyer's involved, which, which agreement has the buyer involved? Well, a deposit receipt 
is an old name for the purchase contract because the buyer would get the contract, which was the receipt of the deal. So that makes sense that in that one, the buyer would give some instruction. But, but let's see why we could rule out the other three. The listing is between the broker and the seller. It has nothing to do with the buyer, so buyer wouldn't be involved. The TDS, that's a disclosure that the seller fills out where they say what's wrong with the house. That has nothing to do with telling the broker some authority, and, and they're not even the buyer. Agency disclosure, that's something that the broker gives a seller or a buyer saying, hey, if I represent you, I have a fiduciary duty to you. So Bravo, Charlie, and Delta really wouldn't be anything where the buyer is directing any authority to anybody. But the deposit receipt or the purchase contract where the buyer says, hey, I instruct the agent to do this with my money and, and this and that, that would be so. So 65 is alpha. 66, a valid enforceable contract requires what? Well, all four, all three of these are kind of good, but Charlie is better. Either a genuine offer and acceptance or a meeting of the minds. Either a genuine offer or acceptance or a meeting of the minds. 66 is Charlie. 67, straight vocabulary. Riparian water applies to all the above, rivers, streams, channels. Okay, take a deep breath. We're kind of at the halfway point, so hang in there. 68, when a dam broke, the flow of water stripped the land in front of you. So this kind of, remember that other question? We had a river added land that was accretion. This one is the opposite, kind of a, a violent tearing away of your land. That's avulsion, delta avulsion. 69, when the government gives you permission to use a body of water, basically, that, that's different than government taking, right? Eminent domain was when the government condemns your property and then takes it and then has to pay you money, but that's not what happened in this question. In this question, the government granted permission to a non-riparian owner to use, that's called appropriation. Make sure you see the difference. So 69, the answer is Charlie. 70, if you have an open loan, meaning you can borrow money, pay it down, borrow money, pay it down, then it would benefit you if you want to keep borrowing money. A closed-end loan, you borrow money, you pay it down, and it's retired. So this question is saying, an open-end provision in a mortgage would benefit the borrower the most if he, Delta, borrowed additional money. Borrowed additional money. Okay, we're going to take a five-minute break here, and I'm going to clear my throat. So put a little mark that we're on number 70. And I'll see you in a second.